to me as the moderator. <laughs> uh, I would like to uh, welcome all the viewers who are watching us live on Facebook right now. Uh, my name is Zan Azli. Uh, I'm a journalist and I'm also a filmmaker and writer. Uh, I have been invited by uh, the organizers, CIJ, Center of Independent Journalism, and uh, C4, we've got to get this correct, Center to Combat Corruption and Co Cronyism to moderate the session. I've done lots of moderations before, panels and discussions and all that, but this, uh, to be honest, is going to be the first one that I'm doing on Zoom. Facebook right now. Uh, my name is Zan Azli. Uh, so I'm, I'm a journalist and I'm also a filmmaker and writer. I am, uh, this is my first, first, <laughs> I'm moderating it for the first time on Zoom. Uh, I've done workshops, I've done online lectures all on Zoom, but this is the first panel that I'm moderating. So please do forgive me if there's any mistakes that I do. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so uh, what the, the title of the talk show that we're going to have today is My Right to Know in Time of Crisis. Uh, and we are doing this in conjunction with the International Universal Access to Information Day. Uh, and uh, the 2020 theme under UNESCO's uh, day is uh, access to information, saving lives, building trust, and bringing hope. Uh, and as we all know right now, we are in a situation which uh, the world has never encountered before, at least you know, in, the new, in the modern history, we have not encountered it before. Um, COVID-19, it's, uh, it's all over the world, it's affecting us. Um, it's a pandemic. Uh, many countries are on lockdown or at least getting out of lockdown. And Malaysia is similar, right? Uh, we, 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 have been, we have been on lockdown and now we are in our recovery mode. The numbers are still increasing. And in a situation like this, it's very important that information gets out there for the public to access, right? Um, and we have a, a very, very, very respectable panel. Uh, and I would like to introduce the panelists right now. We have uh, Cynthia Gabriel from uh, C4, the Center to Combat Corruption and Cronyism. Uh, she's the executive director there. Hi, hi, Cynthia. How are you? Hi, I'm fine. Hi, Zane. Ah, yes. In case anybody out there who doesn't know, Cynthia is a, a, a fixture in the activism uh, scene in Malaysia. Uh, we all know Cynthia Gabriel. <laughs> Thank you for being here with us. Uh, we have Mina Rahman, who is uh, from Sahabat Alam Malaysia and also a lawyer from Penang. How are you, Mina? I'm fine. Thank you. Very nice to see you here today. Uh, we have uh, YB Nick Nazmi, uh, who is the member of parliament from Setia Wangsa. Uh, and also, I think our children used to go, our kids used to go to the same kindergarten, YB. If you remember, <laughs> yes. we used to meet each other during sports days and concerts. Yeah, that, those were the days. <laughs> How are you? Good, good. Okay. Uh, we, we, have, <laughs> we have Wachala Naidu from uh, CIJ, right? Uh, how are you, Wachala? I'm good. Thank you very much. Hope I was well too. <laughs> and we have Quet Sir Kwang King a very well-known data journalist uh, and, uh, uh, and we have him here today to represent the media and uh, I'm sure he processes a lot of information that he gets. Uh, how are you, Quet? Uh, good, good. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. Hey, nice to see you. I'm, I'm a big fan of your work. <laughs> okay, I think we will go right into it. Uh, we'll go right into, we don't want to waste time. So we'll go right into what we want to discuss today. Uh, I think the first person that we're going to call on is Washla. Uh, can, can, can we start with you? Um, the, the, the first, first, first question that I would like to ask, and this goes out to you, is that can you elaborate on the current status of uh, civil society, CSO's advocacy for a new um, RTI re uh, legislation or a right to information legislation? Um, give us a little bit of background. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Zan, and thank you everyone for uh, being part of this discussion today. And before we start talking about the CSO's advocacy or the current status of RTI in Malaysia, we need to locate the um, right to information, as what Zan said, in the current context. So it's a context of crisis. It's also a context where we've gone through um, certain political upheaval changes in government. And there is an extensive focus now and heavy reliance for information and data. 
especially as you sort of like combat this public health crisis. There is a need for information, information that is verifiable and timely. There is, of course, in the, in the same context, the, there is increased censorship and there is also increased content regulation. So the question is, as we continue with all our advocacies around right to information, we have the same questions, you know, in terms of transparency, accountability of the government, and we are also battling with, inter, you know, battling a little, or battling quite a bit, I, I would say, um, on the increased crackdown on dissenting opinions of crisis. So with this context, if we are to trace back um, the work and advocacy um, around right to information, the, the CSO, so civil society organizations, started sometime back in 2005, 2006. There was a push and a, a, a really good momentum, really, um, in bringing together different uh, stakeholders and groups, um, which actually led to the enactment of the Penang and Slango Freedom of Information enactments. So these two are benchmarks for us and, and in fact landmark when it comes to right to information in Malaysia and how we can basically be able to access it. Now, over the years, we've seen different levels of government's commitments when it comes to a new legislation. And we will discuss later why there's a need for a new legislation at the national level, yeah? Uh, the, the previous uh, government's manifesto, the Pakatan Harapan's manifesto, made a pledge to review the Official Secrets Act and move towards a new legislation. This was subsequently uh, reiterated where the, the former prime minister, as well as the former or de facto law minister, um, Dato Wiki Liu, the past uh, law minister, who had um, committed to repealing, and I'm stressing the word here, repeal of the Official Secrets Act so that we can move towards a more open process of transparency. Yeah? And in the last year, we've been very successful, I would say, in, in having more open conversations and discussions with the government. The Legal Affairs Division under the Prime Minister's office had opened itself up for collaboration with civil society and other stakeholders. There were a series of meetings that we had jointly organized um, between civil society and the government under Bayou. We had a national stakeholders consultation last year in November followed by a new, uh, an expert group meeting on right to information this year in July. And there were also commitments to continue discussions. We had a civil society government dialogue with Suhakam just last month. But these were all, you know, uh, after years of work where we had tried to build relationship and trust. Of course, now we are at a point where it's a kind of a wait and see when it comes to the government's commitments because we've really not heard of a clear commitment on how the government want, you know, sort of foresees the, the pursuit of the new legislation. However, at the civil society level, I'm sorry, at, at the civil service level from Bayou, there is still commitment in terms of wanting to proceed with the process that were already initiated. Yeah, there are of course many outstanding issues when it comes to right to information legislation at the national level. You know, some of it basically we need to look at how do we balance because every time we talk about right to information, you know, our whole sec secrecy climate comes into play because we are always concerned with the Official Secrets Act and the and the discourse or the narrative is the fact that we need to balance the national security imperative with right to information. We need to also understand and align our state level laws now, Penang and Slango, and, and uh, with a new legislation at the national law. There's of course, there is all the discussion that still needs to be unpacked in terms of how do we look at the scope, the powers of oversight bodies, but these are outstanding issues that we hope that the, the, the campaign or the advocacy and the collaboration with, with the government will address as we move forward. Is there is there any uh, complications or I guess uh, problems seeing that like like you mentioned just now we are in a situation where we, we had our general elections 
two and a half years ago. Uh, and then there was instability, there was a change in government. One government was committed to a certain thing and then another government probably not so committed to that. Uh, what is the concern there? Um, there, are, there are two levels of thing, right? Because uh, at the government level, at the ministerial level, the, the commitment is still quite vague. We don't know what is the current commitment in terms, or it has not been uh, publicly articulated yet yeah, in terms of how they're going to move forward on a new legislation or law on right to information. And it's of course, you know, when it comes to civil society, we've always said that a law on right to information is not going to work yeah, if the law on, you know, the, offic the Official Secrets Act is not repealed. Yeah, it has to be well aligned in such a way. But I, what I want to say is there is actually continued commitment at the civil service level. Our civil servants are still committed because, the, because by you, the Legal Affairs Division is continuing the work. So it just needs to now be very clear how the work by Bayou yeah, is actually going to proceed in the way that was envisioned last year when we had all the dialogues and the collaboration. So that's what we hope to hear from the government. So it's not a question of, we, we, we're not sure yeah, if it's going to be um, a new law. What, what we are hearing is that OSA is back on the table. We've heard this mentioned a number of times that, hey, we still need the OSA for security reasons, yeah? So it's back on the table. It's not as clear cut as last year when both the prime minister and the minister, the de facto law minister then had said, we are doing away with OSA, you know? So there's a lot of challenges there in terms of commitments. So you mentioned OSA as being a very important element in this. Um, what, what do you think uh, on your side? What are the fundamental principles that, uh, that should be in the new le legislation on the RTI? Um, you know, yeah, as we move forward in terms of a new legislation, I mean, later on, we'll be talking about the different challenges, you know, uh, in Penang and in Slango, and you'll be talking about, you know, Cynthia's own experiences and other things these as well. But I think, uh, you know, I'll just start with one. I think what we need to look at is first and foremost, information must be made public. Information held by public officers must be made public. So there is, should be an obligation by the government, the state, and it's different apparatus to make all information public. Yeah. And that should also be then uh, be on the basis of another fundamental principle, which is maximum disclosure. Now, all information must, there has to be a presumption that all information must be made accessible, you know, and subject only to, you know, uh, non-disclosure when it's narrowly interpreted uh, in terms of exemptions. So I'll come back later in terms of the different principles, I think once we've heard the, about the different challenges. Okay. Uh, if, if I may, I would like to move on to Cynthia. Uh, Cynthia, your work uh, with C4, it's uh, a lot about promoting uh, accountable governance and uh, eradication of, of, of corruption. How does this relate to a more, to a more participatory governance process uh, when it comes to the right to information, Cynthia? Uh, thank you very much, Zan. I first wanted to thank the organizers uh, this is a very distinguished panel, so it's really an honor to be part of it. And more so because uh, the issue is one that is really important. Uh, Wachala has given us a, a, a framework of where things are when it comes to the law, but I just want to bring it down to the rakyat level, the people level. And the issue also is about uh, the political turbulence that we are currently experiencing in the country has brought to surface so many issues in which secrecy laws have actually allowed the government to abuse their powers, one, and second, to actually hide behind the veil of secrecy uh, and to hide the sins of corruption even behind the Official Secrets Act and many of the other acta that uh, do not allow for public disclosure. So I just want to take on a couple of examples. And I think uh, one important thing to note is also the five years when I served as a 
a city councillor in Pataling Jaya. It was under that uh, NGO, non-political non party category. It, it was a bit of a culture shock when I saw for myself the level of secrets that was being held at government level. What I wanted to describe was that in different departments in the council itself, uh, there was a officer with that all important chop of Sulit for every document that was actually going to be uh, recorded. Even municipal council meeting minutes were secret. So it was really grand and it was really revolutionary that uh, the first uh, uh, Selangor Menteri Besar after Pakatan Harapan, uh, sorry, at that time it was uh, Pakatan Rakyat, uh, won the elections. I think one of his big commitments was to establish a freedom of information enactment. And uh, I'll let YB Nick Nazmi describe that a bit more. But what I wanted to say was this was really directly in confrontation with the many secrecy policies, secret, secret documents that uh, were before us. And that was at local government level. So when I was there, there were a couple of issues that were raging. And one of it that I can remember was the building of a highway called the Kidex Highway above the Laburaya Damansara Puchong. So many of you who live in Pataling Jaya and KL will know which highway I'm talking about because the traffic was so horrendous. They were thinking of building a highway above a highway. So it would be like a double decker highway over the LDP. And that highway was going to evict like about I, I don't know, a couple of thousand homes. And it was really going to uh, take on a lot of uh, land space, which was already being occupied by Pataling Jaya residents who were living there for years. Now, the point that I wanted to make was, uh, even though these residents were, were living there for years, they had no clue that there was a huge project being developed. And let me tell you, the building of a highway has nothing to do with national security issues. It's an infrastructure project issue, which was actually mired in secrecy. So a couple of, I, I call them aunties and uncles, la, senior citizens in, in PJ, they went and applied for FOI to actually get information on the contract, how much it cost, why so expensive, why do we need another highway, and so on and so on. And the reason also was, despite Salango uh, leading in having a freedom of information enactment, and then uh, Penang followed after that, uh, the reason that kept, kept coming back was, oh, sorry, because this is a federal project, uh, we cannot release some info because it's under the Official Secrets Act. The contract is under the OSA. So many things like this happen. And, and one of the motivations to set up an anti-corruption, good governance, accountable um, framework for the right year to push for in this country, in the lead up to GE 14, GE, after GE 13 and so on, was essentially this, that information is power. And I just wanted to say that we really have to take it, and YB Nick can, can disagree with me, that really the people in power just prefer that we know less. The less we know, the easier it is for them. So mm -hmm. that is why pushing for an access to information law empowers the right yard to ask the right questions, to get the right information, and to advocate for the right things. Because no information, how do we even express ourselves uh, articulately and in a way that's being informed? Now, with the space that I have to speak, I wanted to say the political turmoil now, actually, has brought to the fore a couple of interesting stuff. Before GE14, we had the 1MDB audit report being classified as, the, as official secrets. Mm -hmm. It's bizarre that you do a, so an audit and then you classify it as secret because you don't want the people to know. You don't want the people to know how much was actually being stolen. And then now you find that because of the change of government, the finance minister suddenly talks about, oh, 101 projects uh, went through direct negotiations. Now, this is another issue which links to public uh, access to information. It's about public procurement. Billions of taxpayers' money actually get used for public procurement. And currently, our public procurement process is just off the radar for public 
nobody really knows how contracts are being awarded, how this contractor got a particular project, how come um, this amount of money is actually being utilized. And every Auditor General's report in Parliament speaks about the wastage and sometimes corruption, not all of it is corruption, the leakage that happens in the civil service because of these issues of uh, poor policies related to the public procurement process. So do we need a public procurement law? That's another debate. I think, yes, we do. Yes, we do need an access to information law to be able to know a lot of these things. And then we have very, very recently, like two days ago, some of us may have missed the news, uh, Tengku Adnan settled his tax debt of 57 million with the LHDN. Uh, and that settlement is not made known to the public. So some say, okay, that could be his private money. But he served as Federal Territories Minister for a couple of years. He's being charged for corruption. And suddenly, 57 million is just settled by the LHDN without the public even being told what the settlement deal is, is about. Now, this is the state of affairs in our country that every other development project which hinges on mega, which hinges on uh, massive um, uh, challenges to sustainable development. I won't even say Penang because we have such a seasoned uh, lawyer taking on so many cases coming up in Penang. But it's all over the country really about uh, where we are when it comes to how much the rakyat knows or doesn't know, but needs to know. So I, I actually, I don't want to sound like a cynic, but I think that when we actually move towards an access to information law, that's when we can actually say something really democratic, revolutionary is taking place because that information is so powerful. It's going to empower the people in a way like it has never been done uh, before. And I also wanted to just say one more uh, small thing that uh, there are countries that actually have both legislations like India, Kenya, a couple of other Commonwealth countries that have the OSA, as well as introduce the freedom of information legislation. Um, so is that the best way forward for Malaysia? I think these are some things that maybe in the Q&A we, we should be talking about because uh, in these countries, the uh, OSA is like minimized. So which means um, basically the exemption clauses are, are, are much less. Uh, and you have a lot more uh, issues for public disclosure as opposed to secrecy law. So which means actually uh, building uh, processes of judicial review into the OSA, breaking it down into what should really be secret, what should not. And as I mentioned just now, like infrastructure projects and all that should never ever be classified uh, as secret. So uh, in ending, I think this is a huge challenge because we might say as Rakyat, yes, we want a, a access to information law, we want a right to information law. But there's a, there's a huge challenge when it comes to infrastructure around uh, getting that to be implemented properly. Uh, and we've had experiences of applying through the uh, right to information law in Salango. Uh, and at that stage, it was really quite uh, uh, at an unprepared stage. We were sent to different offices and then we went to some of the offices, the information officers were not there and, and so on and so forth. So it, it's real. I think it's, a, uh, some people say it's a high hanging fruit, but it might be something that we should uh, work towards making, making it not just real, but uh, effective towards its implementation. Thank you. Cynthia, you've painted such a, <laughs> a very, very detailed scene uh, of, 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 of the OSA. Now, what, what do you think if, if, I mean, you and your organization, you've done a very detailed review of the OSA, right? Yeah. Uh, what are the elements in the OSA that you think is preventing this access? What needs to be changed? And I think this goes hand in hand with what Washla is also planning to talk about, the, the challenges and what the principles that should be included in it, right? Yeah, uh, well... Uh, for one, 
the minute you have a law which has very vague provisions, then you know it's open to abuse. So that is primary about the OSA. Uh, the definition of secret is so um, vague uh, that it actually covers a very wide net of uh, issues which can be considered secret. So one of the recommendations is to actually uh, break it down further. The other is to include a, a judicial review. I mean, like an ouster clause process, which I will leave it to Mina to describe even more. Can you actually review, uh, say, a charge under the OSA? I mean, several journalists have been charged under the OSA over time. And one journalist has recently been uh, probed by the police under this uh, issue of the uh, fire at the Sultan, Sultan Amina Hospital. Uh, so it, it is uh, about being able to challenge the secrecy law. And that component is not there. And so now instead of casting the, wide so, so the net so wide, and it's a strict liability law, which means you also can go to jail for, for holding a document which, which has a chop and if you're found guilty and things like that. So I think many of these need to be reviewed. And how is it that uh, we want to argue if the OSA should be repealed? I, re I do remember the former law minister said, oh, yeah, yeah, we will repeal, but we will include several secrecy elements into the access to information law. Uh, he, he said that at, at a conference uh, that, that he gave a keynote speech and, and so on and so forth. So I think that's really, uh, the main challenge about um, trying to reform um, secrecy laws in our country because it is primarily about the OSA, but it isn't just about the OSA. So we also have acts like uh, the Sedition Act, which come together really to create that uh, culture of uh, um, a lack of public disclosure. And so if the public said something that sounds insulting or critical, uh, they could also be charged under the Sedition Act. So we, we have an armory of legislation that has been very successful in creating a fear, uh, in creating a doubt. Uh, but of course, social media has changed quite a bit of that. So I think we need to use that to galvanize why the Official Secrets Act needs a proper review and maybe very experienced lawyers uh, should come around to have a round table around looking at the reasons why the Official Secrets Act needs to be reformed if not completely repealed altogether. Um, th thanks, thanks, Cynthia. Uh, I would like to take the opportunity also uh, to actually uh, let the audience out there know that you are free to post your questions in the uh, Facebook comment section. Uh, we will try our best to look at your questions and we'll see if our panelists can answer your questions. So anytime, do feel free to, uh, to just post any, any questions or confusions that you have, just, just post it up there. Um, we've been talking a lot about lawyers and before we go on to Mina, I would actually uh, would like to go to uh, YB Nick first because Cynthia did mention uh, her experience uh, being in, in, the, in the Slango government. Uh, so I would like to find out from YB Nick, YB Nick, um, from your experience, um, could you actually share with us what actually led to the uh, adoption of the uh, Freedom of Information enactment in Slango? Okay, hey, um, well, I think, uh, in fact, it was the CIJ campaign um, that took place um, years before that. Uh, and I think that definitely influenced uh, us that when we took over, uh, we decided uh, to have uh, the Freedom of Information uh, enactment uh, introduced in Slango. But in the first instance, I think, as, as um, Cynthia rightly said, uh, you know, we have, you know, the OSA, for example, is very much inherited from the British. Um, it has a very much uh, colonial and also Cold War uh, worldview that, that shaped these two legislations. Um, and it has been very influential to our bureaucracy um, for, since independence. Uh, so I think, you know, the moment we said that we wanted to introduce FOI, um, and as things normally are done in Malaysia, 
a bill is prepared by the executive, the bill that came out was, you know, there was nothing, not really much freedom of information in the bill at all. So, you know, and I think a lot of the backbenchers at that time were very critical. Uh, and so the, the administration at that time under Tan Sri Khalid uh, and the State Assembly, they decided that uh, for, for a, a group of backbenchers, uh, Sa'ari Sungai, uh, Henayo at that time were in Selangor and myself were among those who were appointed the, to the select committee uh, to look into the bill and, and see how we can amend it uh, as close as possible to reflect the spirit of, of FOI. Um, so I think we managed to, to the, the bill that was eventually passed was much better in our opinion. Um, but of course, as, as Cynthia rightly said, um, I think the, the, the challenge was, it, then the next challenge would be implementation. Uh, and I think that will always take some time. Um, I think the state government's role is obviously to educate uh, the public and civil society and opposition. It was quite interesting because in any other... Uh, in any other government, you would, you would expect the, the opposition to welcome this uh, and play a big role in making use of FOI. But because at the same time, we were arguing for FOI at the federal level and they did not want to pass it. So the opposition did not make use at all of the uh, FOI enactment. Uh, similarly, uh, something slightly separate, but which uh, Selangor and Penang started as well and then it has been adopted by the federal government is the Declaration of Assets public declaration of assets by um, legislators in Selangor and Penang. I think we started only with the executive. Uh, in uh, the federal government, uh, it was uh, the government MPs. Uh, and now even in the Perikatan National Government, is being done uh, publicly by the uh, ministers. So, uh, but what I think we still need to look into is that there's not much, there's not many journalists who are involved in uh, going through the details because I, can, I know a few of the ministers personally, uh, regardless of which government, and I know that the assets that reflect, some of them, uh, you know, they have lavish weddings and whatnot, and they're poorer than me, uh, and I'm not that rich. So <laughs> those numbers just doesn't add up. And, and these are the things that I think will take time for the journalists, uh, you know, to, to use the information. Uh, and I think that that's the next challenge. But obviously, dismantling the legislation, putting up a new legislation for access to information, that is very crucial. Uh, I think it's very difficult with uh, OSA uh, to, to exist. Even to amend it is very, very difficult. I accept. I think no one questions the need to protect uh, real uh, uh, information, which uh, defense or security, which are really needed to be confidential. But the question is that the presumption now under OSA is that everything, you know, even a, gov a, a tissue paper that I take up from a government meeting is presumed to be sulit, right? So that, that is the, the, the challenge that we have. And so that's why uh, uh, we, we need a new uh, piece of uh, legislation. Uh, even the Whistleblower Act, I think that we've passed is not sufficient. We've seen that how, for example, Rafizi was caught with, with the Bafia law. Uh, when he released uh, the account details. Uh, so these are, are, are the things that need to be put in place. And, and secondly, um, I know Quack, for example, does a lot with uh, data. Um, uh, you know, the, the problem that we have with uh, DOSM, the Department of Statistics, is that statistics is considered as a national treasure to be guarded secretly, not for any, you know, so that no one can access it. So which is a bit astounding. We live in the world of big data, uh, where so many things can be done. Uh, for example, I know in the US, they actually look that they, they studied uh, in terms of COVID that uh, blacks and the poor Americans are disproportionately suffering from COVID uh, compared to other races. But you try to ask either Dawson or even KKM, you'll be astounded to find that, uh, I mean, Cynthia would have the experience within the government departments, um, they don't talk to each other. Right, because these are all their own fiefdoms that they don't want to share. Uh, I've been told that in Kementerian Pendidikan, Ministry of Education, there are 14 departments. And even within these 14 departments in Ministry of Education, it's very difficult for them to talk to each other. So that's another thing like open data and all that is very crucial because we have all the, the, the technology now to, to make use of those data. Obviously, taking into account of privacy and all those things. 
but how do we manage this data to to um, for a better informed uh, society in the country? Uh, YB, uh, in your experience uh, in, in, in the Selangor government before, what, what do you think are the five positive elements of the Selangor FOI enactment? And now that you're on the federal level, how do you see your role you know, as a legislature in pushing forward the plans for, for a new, I guess, federal RTI? Five good things about FOI. I think the fact, I, I can't, I don't, I'm not sure that I can name five or not, but certainly the fact that we can put FOI on the table uh, because it was so much a taboo. Uh, I accept that it's not a perfect law. I know, I know that they were, you know, probably Cynthia and a lot of other people were trying to access um, and it, wasn't, it was quite difficult. But the fact that FOI is now a legislation in, in Slango and Penang, I think that's very useful uh, because it breaks that, that my, uh, mentality that, that we cannot have an FOI bill in Malaysia or that all hell will break loose. Um, it was very much limited. Again, because a lot of our laws are federal, uh, as Cynthia rightly pointed out. I mean, things like, uh, because for example, the building of highways, it involves the federal government. So then they come in with that and say, you know, you can't use um, uh, the Slango FOI uh, to do that. What I can do now, sadly, in these things, I mean, we, we can start campaigns and all that, but ultimately in Malaysia, the card is still being held by the executive. Uh, you know, um, 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 we, we, we hardly have cases of private members' bill uh, being, being able to see the, the light of day. Uh, so I think it still depends uh, on political will from the executive uh, to introduce it. And, and I think um, we, we should, uh, you know, um, in these times of crisis, uh, it can be an opportunity because this is where any government will find that I, I think the day of one big party dominating the government is over. Um, and, and I think that's where the interest is to put as much democratic uh, scrutiny uh, and access uh, to both sides so that they can make use of the legislation. Because, well, now you say I'm government and I don't want you to access the information, you don't know how long you'll be government, right? And, uh, and vice versa. So I think that is very crucial, but obviously um, the, the Prime Minister and the, the Cabinet holds the trump card whether they want to do it or not. Thanks, thanks. Um, I'd like to move on to Mina. Mina, you filed FOI applications before. I mean, you've represented the Tanjung Bunga Residents Association, Sungai Ara Residents Association. Uh, can, can you, would you be willing to share your experience with us? So how was the process like? Yeah, with pleasure. First, uh, allow me to uh, thank the organizers for having me. And uh, it is indeed a pleasure to be with all of you. Um, as I pointed out to Watsala, sometimes this discussion is very Klang Valley centric. So it's very good that um, it's not, not due to any one of you. I think that uh, it's, a, it's very good that we engage with more people outside of the Klang Valley. And certainly that's why I agreed to do this. And I'd like to push a lot more of the um, groups around, uh, particularly in Penang, you've got a vibrant civil society, but not many are actually aware of the, um, the freedom of information enactment that we have and how to use them and so on. So there's a lot that we can do. And certainly education is key. Um, before I go into the, the legal challenge, I mean, the, the two cases to illustrate the point, I think the, the, the case is one of a glass half full or the glass half empty. Um, and we as activists, as uh, we all know, we grab anything that we can have. Um, and then we have to use it as a tool to fight. So it's very good that Penang actually has the freedom of in information enactment, um, although there are limitations which I will talk about. But uh, what was very important is that uh, it has positive elements, um, basically that the fact of its existence itself is a big one. I mean, uh, the fact that you have a freedom of information, in fact, the rationale says that um, it's, the, it's to provide for disclosure of information um, for the public interest, um, the right of access to information to every department of uh, the state. So these are all very important recognitions that, uh, that I think that the Penang people and I think the Slango citizens are lucky compared to the other states where you don't have such, a legisl such legislation. Um, of course, and during the passing of the 
the, the Freedom of Information enactment in Penang, um, there was a big thing about this being part of uh, the CAT initiative, which is the transparency, competency, and accountability. So acknowledgement that this is very key for open government, good government, and so on. So I think all that is, um, is, is well recognized. Um, it's fairly simple to use. You can actually go to the, to the, the office where um, the state apparatus is, which is in Komta. You can even, you pay 50 ringgit initially. Sometimes you have to pay 100 ringgit depending on the nature of the information you seek. Um, the form actually is pretty straightforward. Um, so there are some positives and, and the of official offices of information that actually are facilitative. They explain to you how to do it and so on. So um, it's not like you need a lawyer. You don't have to go and hire a lawyer to go and file an information application. And the fact that you actually filed to a wrong information official, for instance, you actually sought the information from this particular department, the law actually says that it's the duty of the information officer to send it to the right department. So that if you, you know, you don't have, to, it's not like a case of, oh, you got to go back and refile and refile. It's their duty to actually pass it on to the right information officer. Um, and there are time limits imposed. You apply for the information. There's a time period for, for them to respond. So this is, this is not like, you know, you send it and then it sits there forever and you don't know what going, what's going on. So there are some time limits. Uh, so that's useful. Um, and then even if where the information is exempt, the, the law actually states that if the public interest um, element of the, for the disclosure outweighs the risk of disclosure, the state actually has a discretion. That means the state has discretionary powers, even though if the document is too late or classified or whatever, that if the risk is, uh, you know, is, is worse, but the benefit outweighs the risk, you, they can disclose. But of course, at the end of the day, um, it, pro, it puts a, a lot of discretion on the hands of the state. The final thing is it has a procedure for appeals and we actually tested the appeals process and I'll come to that in a little while. Um, so the, what are the limitations? So I, I listed the positives. The limitations, um, it actually limits it. The Freedom of Information Act enactment actually says that this is subject to any other law which is uh, governs disclosure of information. This is the code for it's subject to the Official Secrets Act as well. So what it means is that you've got two, two pieces of legislation, but um, there is not such a thing as the freedom of inform the right to information overriding the Official Secrets Act. This is what is in Sri Lanka. I learned it from the webinars that CIJ has organized before. In Sri Lanka, the right to information legislation overrides every other legislation. And you don't even need to go and justify with the, why you need the information, that it is public interest, blah, blah, blah. You don't even need to make that case. And, you know, I keep stressing this. Here you have Sri Lanka, a country torn with civil riots, you know, of the worst kind. People blowing up, you know, bodies and so on. I mean, what can be worse than that, you know, in terms of national security? And yet in this country, we still hide behind the notions of national security. So if Sri Lanka can do it, why can't Malaysia? I think we've got a good um, leverage there. So, so the provisions exist that actually make it, um, you know, for the government to say we, don't, we can't supply the information, especially when it is the deliberation of any uh, uh, minutes relating or decision relating to the state exco. Now, many of these, like as Cynthia pointed out, the state exco makes decisions, or even the state planning committee makes decisions on so many levels, whether how you award a forest concession, how you de-gazette a water catchment forest and site a, 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 disp, you know, a toxic waste facility up on a forest reserve, or you change a, a peat swamp, which is so important, and uh, you, know, you allow uh, obnoxious development happening. I mean, forest, land matters, uh, you know, uh, water issues. These are all important uh, issues. How, can, how on earth are they national security? Absolutely reprehensible to call them official secret or that you can't have access to information. 
So this is something that I think we have to, we have to comp constantly scrutinize. So no, even there is a provision which says that in information affecting the economy of the state, which is preju prejudicial to the economic interests of the state or financial interests of the administration of the state. What is all this? It's very broad discretion. If you misuse your money as the Penang government, we are all up, up in arms with the, you know, the Penang Transport Master Plan and the huge reclamation mega project that's happening. You know, how do they manage the finances? This is, we, we pay taxes. We have a right to know. So these are issues that actually needs to be ventilated. And so we do have an appeals process. So those of us uh, who are in the, who are activists, we need to use the mechanisms that are there to explore the boundaries and the parameters and bring on board the check and balances that need through an active judiciary. And I believe that currently um, the judicial, uh, you know, the judiciary is actually pretty open to discuss some of these things. So the test is whether public interest for disclosure outweighs the risk of disclosure. So, but that is a matter for the judiciary, not for the government to decide. Um, so let me come to the two cases uh, of the experience. So the first experience we had was actually for the Sungai Ara residents who were fighting the Sunway City project by Sunway. Sunway, as you know, claims that Dato Jeffrey Chia claims that, you know, they are committed to the sustainable development goals. And, you know, but we find that, you know, it was quite hypocritical to actually cite a huge development on top of a, 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 a slope, which is very steep. And so the people of Sungayara took this matter to the, to the, they challenged it on the grounds of the uh, planning, that planning permission should not be granted. And they won at the appeals board level. And then they went to the high court, they lost at the high court, and then they went to the court of appeals. One of the things that we were looking for was actually the state government's decision, the state planning committee's decision over what are special projects, guidelines for special projects where hill land development is allowed. So the state can actually make a, a decision as to exempting certain projects, private projects, housing projects that can be allowed on hill land. So this was a very controversial issue. So we wanted to look at that. We wanted to look at the minutes because we were of the view that um, it's very important to understand what actually went on. So the Sungayara residents went um, and filed the information. This was in the jurisdiction of Plan Malaysia. Um, and Plan Malaysia uh, rejected the, 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 the fact, that, I mean, it said that we had no right to look at it. They said that uh, this is official secret. It's state planning committee, so you can't look at it. So we went on an appeal process. We used the appeal process. So we filed an appeal, and this was the first time an appeal was heard. It was not the first time that an appeal came forward um, because in Penang, somebody else had filed an appeal but never turned up for the hearing. So we were the first to turn up for the hearing. And then the first experience was we had three commissioners. One was a, two were lawyers and one was a, um, a person who was formerly a state government official. Um, and then I, and the first thing that happened, which was shocking to me, was that they walked together to, with the, uh, com the commissioners walked together with Plan Malaysia to have breakfast. Now, when you are fighting Plan Malaysia, I mean, it's like going to court. The plaintiff goes to court and the judge has breakfast with the, the, the defendant. I mean, this was appalling as far as I'm concerned. But I think what really, what this shows is that the commissioners actually there's this, this, there's this, this lack of appreciation that commissioners are actually independent, that they don't need to be spoon fed, let alone literally, you know, but they don't have to be together there. They have to, if you are meeting with the Plan Malaysia, open it to everybody so we know what you're discussing. So the second thing that happened was that when they came out to hear the matter, they said, all of you leave because we had about 30, 40 people in the room. And they said only the rest, the, the, the person who filed the complaint can be there. We said, what the hell is this? This is an appeals board. Under the rules, it says that this, has, this is like a, an open court. So we had to argue. So we argued, this is an open court. The rule says this. So quite obviously, commissioners are not trained. They have no, they're not really familiar with the, the rules. So they decided after an argument that they let, everybody should be there. Finally, you know, you know you, we had to prepare bundles of documents as if we were going to 
the federal court for an argument, but we did that anyway. Um, in it, then they said, would you like to look at the document? Informally they are. So I looked at what we wanted and then we made a decision as to how to proceed further. So the point is, it, you can get it. There are hurdles. But I think what's important here is that we have to test it. We have to take it forward. In future, where the decision is actually, we have to push for grounds of the decision. There have to be precedents so that we build on the case because um, this is how we learn. So the other, the other matter is fine. Eh? Very quickly, I will say, that was the Tanjung Buma Residents Association. The, the state government was pushing the Spinang Transport Master Plan, a huge highway costing a few million dollars, was running through hills and, uh, and through the front yard of all the residents, same like the KIDEX. So we filed an application for um, the conditions of the EIA. There were 70, 72 conditions which were imposed by the Department of Environment. And because it was a state project, the Department of Environment did not give us that information. So we had to go through um, the, we used the Freedom of Information in Act, uh, uh, law and we got it quite easily. But we also got it through the state assembly, uh, assemblyman. That's another way. Our, if you have a strong opposition, they can ask all these questions, public questions in the, I mean, uh, parliament and in the state assemblies. Perhaps that's another tool to use in terms of having information access um, on projects, on conditions, on whatever. So there we managed to get it quite easily, but we had to pay a hundred ringgit. I think that's, that's not too much actually. So these are some of the experiences. My, my, um, my final conclusion is that um, I say the glass is half full because I think it's better than not to have anything. So we are luckier, but I think we have to push the boundaries and the parameters and we need to do it and we can do it. So um, we need to learn, and I, that's why I am, um, you know, very happy with the initiative taken up by CIJ and um, C4 and others who are pushing this, because we do need to, we, we have never won anything, you know, sl slavery or independence never came, or gender equality never came because we sat, but we had to fight and struggle. So I think that uh, we, have, we have some way to go. And uh, I would like to encourage all of us to look at it in a positive light and push as much as we can. And the more we push, the better. Um, and I think the, the, we have to use the judicial, um, the, the judicial mechanism as well. So as Cynthia was saying, um, you know, can we review? Many of these legislations say that the appeals board cannot actually be reviewed. The decision of the appeals board cannot be reviewed, but that's nonsensical. So even if the law says so, um, judicial review cases have held that you cannot ouster the jurisdiction of, the, of the, the, uh, the courts because the courts are there to check and balance the decision-making process. So we use the administrative law principles and so on to challenge some of these things. So um, I'd, I'd end there, but um, I'd like to see this as a way forward um, in a national legislation and let's do everything we can to join hands and push for this as much as possible. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mina. That was very enlightening indeed. Um, I, I'd like to move on to Quick. Quick, you're a journalist, you're a data journalist, uh, and your work revolves around getting information. Um, I, I remember during the MCO, I was producing a news and current affairs talk show uh, on COVID-19 and information regarding COVID-19. A lot of my reporters were complaining that they did not even have access to the press conferences that the ministries and agencies were, were, were doing, were conducting, uh, and they, they could only rely on like, you know, the state, state, state media to actually pass on the information to them. Now, if that was the case, and we had you know, uh, resources where we can actually go you know, away from the press conference and we have resources where the government then provides this information for, for the public or for the journalists, it would be all right. What's, what's your experience? What, what are the challenges that you have faced in trying to obtain like reliable and timely information, Quinn? Um, right. Uh, so first, uh, thanks for having me. All right. So from a journalist uh, perspective, right, um, information and data is extremely important for us because our job is to inform the society, right? And we need information to make a judgment. We need information to explain things, right? So for us, getting information, getting data is part of our job, right? And in Malaysia, right, um, uh, I would just, uh, I, I want to like focus on the part about data, right? Government data. So we have three major problems here, right? One is data is not available. Uh, second is that if, it's, if it is available, sometimes it's not timely. 
if you have the data, you have the latest data, sometimes the quality is bad, right? So you, you need all these three elements, right? It has to be available, publicly available. It has to be timely. You, you, you will be able to get the latest data. And also the quality should be good, right? So for example, right, if um, many people actually don't know that um, the government, Malaysian government, the federal government has an open data policy. And under that policy, we have open data portal, right? Uh, the website is data.gov.my. Right. But if you go to that website, you will see that there are third, over 13,000 of data sets available. That's a lot compared to other countries. That's a lot, right? Uh, but if you search, for example, I just searched like five minutes ago, I searched for COVID-19. I searched for coronavirus. The results return is zero. You imagine the pandemic has started in January. We are now moving into the last quarter of 2020, right? But if you search for covid you search for coronavirus, there's no data set available, right? And so one of my projects, right, um, is to have a look at all the tenders, the procurements made by the government, right, during the pandemic, um, especially during the three months MCO, right? Because the government has to supply uh, hospitals with uh, face masks, PPE, and all kinds of equipments, right? And the same, this type of investigation have been done in other countries, you know, to, they uncovered corruption, you know, uh, because, you know, per, per chase have been made under the name of uh, uh, emergency, under the name of COVID-19, uh, but they were benefiting their cronies and, and, and things like that, right? So I also know that Malaysia, you know, uh, we have a My Procurement website uh, set up by the uh, finance ministry, which they, where they publishes all those uh, tenders and uh, subwood hugger and also direct negotiations, right? The results of all those standards and nego direct negotiations. So if you search for, again, I search for face masks, I search for PPE, right? In, in all languages that you can imagine, right? The result is zero, again, okay, it's zero. So maybe I thought that maybe it's not open tender, maybe it's because uh, it's emergency, so they do it, you know, um, via direct negotiation. So you search under the category of direct negotiation, the results of those uh, purchase, right? The data is February 2017, 2017, three years ago, right? And that was, you know, before the Pakatan Harapan uh, government took power, right? Uh, they took power in 2018, right? And the data is only until 2017. And our finance minister, the current finance minister, released these 100 projects, right? So people were um, curious, you know, what, what about other uh, projects that were given out, you know, via direct neg negotiations? But in that website, uh, it, that website is used by the government to say that oh, we are transparent, you know, we are open about you know, uh, our tenders and things like that. But data is only until 2017, three years ago. Right? And right until now, um, there are other groups that uh, other types of uh, purchase, uh, which means uh, tender and also subwood hardware. But still under those two categories, right, you can't, cannot find anything if you search for face masks or PPE. Right? So I don't know how, I, until today, we don't know how the government purchase all those equipments during uh, the last six months, right? And whether, you know, everything was done, you know, uh, in, in accordance to law and things like that, we don't know. We don't even know who are the importers of all this, you know, whether we get our masks from China or from, from, from other countries, right? We don't know anything about it. So there's no way as journalists, we can investigate any of those things because information is just not available, all right? Um, another a uh, good example is the, the new asset declaration website set up by the uh, MACC that tells you, you know, how rich our ministers and our MPs, right? So if you look at the, the richest uh, politicians in, in the website, right, you know, there are, there, are, there are three of them, right? One is our finance minister, uh, Zafru, Tengu Zafru. The second is uh, Tan Sri Anwar Musa, the FT minister. So, uh, the third one is uh, Jeffrey Kittingan, Dato Jeffrey Kittingan, uh, uh, currently the deputy minister, right? The website tells you that you know, their, their asset is more than 20 million. What does that mean? 100 million, 200 million, 1 billion? We don't know. The whole point of you know, declaring your asset is so that the people, the journalists can monitor your asset, right? Whether you have uh, accumulated you know, a, a, huge, uh, a, a huge wealth you know, uh, when you are in power, right? But if you tell us that their asset is more than 20 million, how are we going to monitor it, right? Next year, we look at numbers again. Of course, it's going to uh, be more and more and it's still more than 20 million. So how do, 
what is the point of setting up that website if you don't want to give all the details, right? That is the quality of the data, right? So the availability of the data, the timeliness of the data, and the quality of the data, right? These are the three things. And so when you don't have the data, what do you do? So as journalists, we you know, pick up our, phone, uh, our phones and we call uh, the relevant ministry or agency to ask for data, right? And most of the time, what happens is that, you know, the civil server would tell you that, okay, I have to refer to my boss. And the boss will refer to his or her boss. And there are numerous boss, bosses above, right? At the end, sometimes your request will reach the minister office. Can you, can you imagine that asking for data, for example, you know, um, data about students in different schools in Malaysia, that kind of request has to reach the minister office. For someone in the minister office, maybe the minister himself needs to make the decision whether to release the data to you. Right? This, is nothing to, this has nothing to do with national security. It's just education data, right? Uh, health data sometimes, right? So why is it, right? That is because... Um, in our current laws and account policies, right, we don't have a very clear, um, they don't empower the civil servants to disclose data, right? They are very afraid to take responsibility, right? Because they are not sure whether data, you know, could be uh, classified under OSA, whether they should give it to you. So they keep referring to the bosses and, and, until they reach the minister office. And usually the answer eventually will be no, all right? And there's no way for us to appeal. There's no law that we can cite, you know, to ask for data. And that's it. Our reporting, the date end is there, right? And this is not, this actually, this issue, right, that is we don't have a legal framework that empower the civil servants to share data with, uh, uh, with, uh, with, the, with the people, right? This has been highlighted in, the, in one of the reports um, done by the World Bank uh, in collaboration with Mampu. Mampu is the agency under the Prime Minister Department that is uh, responsible for pushing for our open data policy. So that report, it was uh, in 2017. That report is called Open Data Readiness Assessment Report, right? What happened is that they invited World Bank Group to come in and they will, do a, they will assess you know, our civil service, uh, our legal systems, our policies to see that if our government is ready for open data or not, and what is the implementation of open data in our country. And they, has, they have already highlighted that, you know, we don't have a clear legal framework, right, to tell, to tell our civil service, you know, what data can be shared, what data cannot be shared, right? So this RTI or FOI is very, 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 very crucial if we want our open data uh, policy to be successful, right? Uh, not the, 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 the one that we have right now. Yeah, so those are some of the, you know, uh, challenges uh, that, that, that we are facing as journalists. Now, now what, what, what do you think can be done? It's, it seems like the government is not uh, giving any priority towards uh, you know, releasing data and information to the public. It's just something that is in the back burner. It's like not so important. We'll, we'll come to it later. Hey, yeah, we promise we'll give you the information. What's, what's, what, do you, what do we do? <laughs> Quack. I think it's, it's really hard when you are trying to convince them that if you share data with us, you know, you allows us to do a better job of monitoring you and to, 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 to investigate whatever wrongdoings you have done, right? Uh, I think that's, that, that, if you're using that path, you know, it's actually quite hard, right? But the other path is that, you know, if the government agencies and ministry, if they are not sharing data among themselves, which is bad for planning, bad for policy making, right? If you don't do that, and if a, a RTI or FOI or a, we, so you will, with the RTI or FOI, then you have the legal framework. When you have the legal framework, you can then can have a much efficient open data policy. So open data policy means that all ministries have to share their data. They have to put all their data in a single um, venue, right? for example, a portal, right? That is, that it has been done in many other countries. So in that case, not just the people, the journalists, the activists can use the data, the civil servant can use the data. They can look at the data provided by other ministries to overcome the silos, the current silos that they have among different ministries. Even if, uh, like, when I want to ask for data about road accidents, right, I try to get a data from the, uh, one of the agency under the transport ministry. What they told us is that, you know, the data is from the police department. Right, I got it. I said, then can you share the data with me? Uh, I believe you have the latest data, right, because you are studying road safety. They told me that, oh, we had the data three years ago. 
Even the transport ministry, the agency that is responsible to study road safety, doesn't have data about road accidents uh, from the police. Police is not sharing with them. When police share with them, police give them an annual report. It's not raw data, but give them an annual report in PDF format. And they pass me that report. And they say, oh, the latest data we got is three years ago. So how do you do policy making, right? Efficient study, right? Uh, to advise uh, the politicians, the, 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 the ministers, the, law, the lawmakers, right? Uh, to, to, to change the laws or, or, or the policies, right? If you don't talk to each other. So if they can um, share the data, right? It is not just good for the people, the, 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 the journalists, the activists, but it's also good for the ministries themselves to talk to each other, right? So if in this case, um, again, RTI is, is very, very crucial because if we have RTI, then when we have, we exhausted all our venues to try to get the data, right? We still can use the, the law and go to the court and ask for uh, the data, right? Uh, the other thing that I have been doing, you know, since uh, two, three years ago is to engaging with uh, the government's uh, civil service. Uh, civil servants who are responsible for the open data uh, policy, uh, for example, Mampu. So they, they actually know all the issues and all the problems uh, with the open data policy and with uh, the how can they better share information uh, with the public. The problem is that there is no political will to you know, set up the, the laws and to make the policies, you know, to make a stand to say that, hey, okay, now, you know, all the civil servants, you all can share data with the public and we give you the power to do that, right? So they are not putting their foot to, to, to say this, right? So it's, it's political will. So in this case, I, I don't think, you know, I mean, further engagement, of course, we can talk to the civil service and try to convince them. Many of them are already convinced, but now as towards the politicians, you know, the, the real policymakers who have the powers to pass laws. And that we need to, you know, uh, we need to increase our, um, pressure on that end. Uh, Watsala, we've heard from all the panelists and they've highlighted all the challenges and the problems that they face. Uh, uh, Cynthia and Mina, for example, they talk about the OSA being such a hindrance on state government because, you know, everything cannot be overruled. The OSA is just there covering everything. Uh, and there is a contradiction between federal and state. Uh, YB Nick Nazmi mentioned that there's a disconnect between even among government agencies you know, uh, in sharing information. Quick just mentioned saying that, you know, okay, fine, the government has an open data policy, but then the data, the data is inefficient. Uh, what are the challenges, what's allowed? What, 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 what say you? What's Allah, I think you're muted. Uh, Sorry about that. Sorry, I muted myself. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, just to reiterate, right, um, we live within this this mindset of people who you know who are just so um, you know used to this climate of secrecy and this fear that by being transparent and revealing information you might be held accountable. That's the that's the climate and environment that our civil service um, you know function under. So that's why everything stamped solid and it's really difficult to access that information. So you really need to break that mindset, that cultural mindset, but breaking that, I mean, to reiterate what Quek just said, it's we need to have the political will, yeah? And there are the two different things that's really needed. One is, as we have said, um, you know, the push for a legislation where substantively it needs to ensure that all public information is public yeah, but very, very narrow into, uh, exemptions. Yeah, Mina gave some examples earlier about how in some countries, um, I think Cynthia also talked about how, you know, in certain Commonwealth countries like in India and um, Kenya, where they have both sets of laws. You have the, you know, very archaic uh, OSA and then they have a FOI or right to information legislation. Now, what is important in these laws are the fact that the, the public interest always overrides yeah, any kind of secrecy element or national security element. That's what we need to push for. That ongoing challenge that we have, that substance that we are pushing for needs to address that. Now, we have both sets of laws, Slango and Penang now. Now, one of the biggest challenge we have with, uh, say, for example, Penang is a cost issue. 
So if we are moving towards a, a legislation, you cannot have exorbitant costs attached to any application. In Penang, for example, if you're filing an application, it's 50 ringgit. Yeah. And if you need data from a number of years, say if you need data for, from four years back, each year they charge you for that data. Yeah. But if, and this is just at the point of filing the application, and there's no guarantee that you're going to get access to the information. Yeah. So there's a high probability that you might burn the amount that you've invested in. Yeah. And then you get the data. So say, for example, you, you need a, 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 a document, yeah, a, a report that's 400 pages. You have to pay additional amount for the you know, photocopying, yeah? Uh, and that's cost, yeah? So if you're talking about information, public information, that accessibility is a key issue. You, information must be available, like what Quack said, but you cannot attach um, additional requirements like who are you why do you need the data you know what's your local standard basically requesting all this information as a public yeah you should have access to information held by public officers so that's another challenge that we need to really address and make sure that any new legislation basically adopts these principles yeah now the other thing that we really need to look at is um, the issue of uh, budget, cost and budget, right? Because of course, when we have a new legislation, there's going to be an enforcement mechanism or an oversight body, and there's going to be a, 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 an institutional mechanism that will have to be set up, right? To ensure that it's enforceable or to ensure that it's implementable. Now, the issue of budget comes into place, yeah? So to make sure that any kind of oversight body that's been set up has the appropriate budget, then budget cannot be tied into a particular, say, ministry or agency. Yeah, so they, they have to have access to independent budget. Because otherwise, you know, like what Amina shared earlier, you know, you have your oversight body or your, your appeals commissioner sitting in and having um, you know meals with the public authorities who are the holders of information so that independence has to be clear the powers and the scope of these oversight bodies must be made clear and added to that of course is the whole issue of budget that has to be also in um, you know be made independent uh, one last thing I think um, in all these contacts of course you know and as, as we push forward towards a new legislation, it's not something that's going to just be there standalone, you know, it has to address the broader legal framework. So we cannot have an, a new legislation where the OSA completely, you know, overrides everything. It has to be the other way around, like what Mina shared in the context of Sri Lanka, the RTI legislation, the RTI law supersedes all other laws. Yeah, so we need to ensure that it is a right to information and it's our right to be able to access it in a timely manner and access information that is reliable and you know, accurate. So that, I mean, those are things that are ongoing challenges, but you know, we are also very conscious that in addressing these challenges, we have to adopt very clear principles and framework of a new legislation. Yeah. Um we have some time and i'm wondering if we, we could have any questions from uh the viewers out there uh we've got one comment uh from uh, andrew ku uh, who says that we, we should not be blaming the british for bad laws uh we've had Medeka for 63 years and, Mal and malaysia for 57 any bad laws could have been abolished by now but the osa has been amended to make it worse <laughs> and, i agree i agree i'm just putting it uh into context that it was shaped by a Cold War mentality and colonial mentality. That's why it's so secretive. I'm not saying that it's correct for us to retain it. it it's true. It's true. It's exactly what you said just now. And, and you know, uh, it, it kind of reflects showing that the authorities are just, you know, they're addicted to being protected, like what Andrew Ku is saying. And, and Quake has mentioned that as well, saying that, it, it, and, and what Salah has mentioned it as well, they're afraid that any information is being given out, then they're going to be held accountable. Like, oh no, <laughs> you know? So yeah, so if there are no questions from the public, maybe we could pose some questions and see if they have any answers or any comments that we can look at. Like for example, for the viewers out there, what, what has your experience been in trying to access information? 
And if we're talking about uh, 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 rights to information uh, law, what do you think should be the elements that are in incorporated into this new law? And, and, and you know, what, what do you guys think? Uh, and let's see if we can give some time to the public to, to, to comment uh, and answer or give any more questions. Um, what, Salah, what, what, what do you think the public should be doing to push for this new law? I mean, it's for their benefit anyway. Actually, there are, there are a series of things that's been planned actually um, as part of the Civil Society Coalition on Freedom of um, Expression. Yeah? Uh, one of the things is, is exactly the questions that you asked earlier. There is a public consultation which has been initiated today uh, for public to share their inputs, their experiences, their recommendations of what should go into the law, their recommendation you know, on what kind of information they want to access and should be made public. You know, so there is an open public uh, consultation and I hope that the public will engage in this consultation to give the feedback so that this could actually inform the gov government's initiatives. Yeah, as I said earlier, by you or the Legal Affairs Division is continuing the process. Yeah? Now, the second thing that the public can do is there's a series of road shows which are happening. We had the first one in Penang a couple of weeks ago and Mina was actually part of the panel there too. But uh, we have another one um, that's going to take place in Johor on the 3rd of uh, October, this week actually. We've got a, a few more planned in Kelantan, um, Sabah, Sarawak. Oh, I don't know what's going to happen to the Sabah one now. Uh, and of course, within the Klang Valley. So, but that's a first level of consultation, yeah? And all these, we've been given assurance from the Legal Affairs Division that there will be a representative, one of their officers attending these consultations so that they can also gather feedback from the CSOs and the public and other stakeholders who are part of these consultations. Now, um, you know, as what uh, was also earlier mentioned, there has to be continued test cases. So people who are filing these cases were filed for applications for information in Slango, Penang, and also we have made requests for information in other states with no legislations. Please do share your experiences with us. Um, you can write to us at cijmalaysia at gmail.com. So all this information will be made publicly available as well as in all our um, platforms. So there will be, we hope to compile all this information and share it with the, the government. Now the CSOs have also um, come up with a CSO um, bill or a model legislation, right? What would work in Malaysia, contextualize all the international standards. We will be doing another series of consultations really to make sure that it's, it's, it's bottom up we want, the, we want the public, uh, we want the different communities, we want to break the urban-rural divide and make sure everybody is able to input into this so that we own the legislation that's been adopted by the state. So we will have another series of consultations. So oh, please keep yourselves um, tuned in to our Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and website. All this information will constantly be uh, uploaded as well. And we also work um, in close collaboration with C4, and other uh, civil society within the CSO uh, freedom of expression um, cluster. Thank you. Thank you, Vatsala. Uh, I think that there is, uh, I don't see any more comments from, from, from the viewers. Uh, and the questions that I asked just now, uh, I think it can still be continued. The discussions can still move on. Uh, I think CIJ uh, is going to have a, going to release a survey, I think a public consultations on right to information survey, where they're inviting the public to uh, share their thoughts on uh, sharing of information, how to obtain government information. And if you have any suggestions, you can actually uh, access this survey uh, from the CIJ uh, website. Right? I think that that's one that, that, that the public can actually you know, be heard. Right? They can, this is a platform that the public can use to be heard as well. Uh, I think from there on, I, we, we can call it a wrap. Uh, uh, thank you so much to all our panelists. Uh, Watsala, thank you very much. Mina Rahman, YB Nick Nazmi, Cynthia Gabriel, Kwok Sir, Kwen Kung. Quack, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, I, think, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much everybody for being here and thanks to all the viewers who have watched it. Uh, this session is, has been recorded. It is being recorded and I'm sure it will be available uh, for anybody to watch later on. Yes. Thank you very much everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.